Welcome back to the Garrett Seminar. It's uh, really exciting. We've had uh, quite a break uh, after um, strikes and holidays, uh, but it's uh, really exciting to start up the Garrett Seminars again, the, the Department of Archaeology's principal seminar series. Um, and to start it with part two of the Rethinking Past Globalization uh, series. The series aspires to genuinely interrogate and problematize the concept of globalization as applied to the historical and archaeological past. Uh, the, our driving question is to what extent can criteria be formulated for identifying past globalizations or globalizing forces uh, and trends with the ultimate goal of making the present relevant in, the, in archaeological research and contributing archaeological perspectives to the question of when did globalization begin. So last term in part one of the series, we heard from a multidisciplinary cohort of um, speakers who represented different approaches to defining and identifying past globalization. And this term in part two of the series, we have uh, a, a nice group of archaeologists who employ a range of case studies uh, ranging from uh, plants, ceramics, commodities, funerary goods, and more to uh, attempt to identify, characterize, and discuss examples of past globalization. So um, it's very exciting to kick off uh, this part two with the topic of food globalization in prehistory uh, with a person who coined the phrase in a pioneering 2011 uh, article in World Archaeology. Uh, Martin Jones uh, was the first Pitt Rivers Professor of Archaeological Science at the University of Cambridge. He works on archaeobotany and archaeogenetics in the context of uh, the broader archaeology of food. In his earlier career, he explored the development of agriculture and later prehistoric in Roman Europe, after which he was very much involved in the development of biomolecular approaches within archaeology. These he applied to research in the spread of farming of both major and minor crops across Asia, most recently in the context of food globalization in prehistory. His most recent project explored the coevolution and Eurasian biogeography of crops and bees. So uh, I turn it over to you, Martin. Thanks very much, Daniel. Well, it's great to uh, be here. So hi, everyone, both in the room and, uh, and, and virtually. And <laughs> And I want to take this topic and uh, start where I often, I often um, like going. That seems to work first time. Okay. okay. Problems here, I think. Yeah, uh -huh. just a movie slide on. Right. Uh, great. Thanks very much. I want to start where, in many occasions, I've, I've ended a lecture um, with this map because, as Daniel has described, a lot of the work of, of, of my group over the last uh, 10 or 15 years has been to put together the, um, these arrows on the map. And I should say a number of other groups around the world have contributed enormously um, to that. And what I want to do in the context of this talk is to get beneath the arrows and ask the question, what, what do they actually mean in terms of <clears throat> human transactions and, and plants moving between real communities? And I think in, in doing that, I'll have two uh, questions or themes in mind. And the first of, of those themes is a sort of axis. Um, at one end is, is living ecosystems of, of living species of which humans are one, engaged and very sensitive to each other's, the minutiae of each other's life cycles. And those ecosystems can move around together. And to a great extent, our model of the early agricultural spread is those mobile ecosystems of, of humans moving around uh, with the plants and animals on which they depend. That's at one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum is the idea of food as a kind of almost an inert commodity that can be exchanged between strangers. Um, and that, that latter uh, end of the spectrum connects with the way that a number of, of scholars have articulated the theme of globalization and the idea of, of, uh, <clears throat> of how ex exchange works and so forth. So uh, on one level, I'm quite interested in that axis between a sort of total living ecosystems and these detached commodities. And the other question in, in my mind will be, 
uh, who's doing it. So by the time of this map, uh, which is 1500 BC, and I'll mention a number of maps in the new article, it, and key parts of this map, as, as we well know, there are um, a number of ranked patriarchal societies with mega sites to which the word urban or city is often attached. And so it's quite interesting in the context of globalization to ask who's doing it, who's driving it, and how does that relate to mm -hmm. those um, landscapes and so forth. I, I want to start by just um, to getting us all up to speed, running through our methodology um, to put maps like that together. But for most of the talk, I'll be asking the question, what do the arrows mean? But just to start by looking back at the uh, approaches um, to the map. Well, underpinning it was the work that the stylist of the room and Harriet Hunt uh, uh, did so brilliantly. And that was to create uh, maps largely from genetics alone in terms of what's happening globally in terms of how those crops are moving around. And you can see the, the three forms of evidence uh, that uh, we use. Um, the, in, in each of these plots here is, is what we call a, a land race. It's just um, uh, a, a plant of, of uh, in this case, millet from a, a sort of un high tech farm somewhere in the world. And each of those pots has a, a geographical position and so forth. <clears throat> and that actually forms the major part of the kind of archaeogenetics that Di and Harriet did. And in addition, some quite key uh, work was done on historic specimens, like the, the Vavilov collections here, where, where Di has led the way, and, and also uh, archaeological specimens, such as those desiccated graves from West China. So it's largely to do with those land raises in pots, and, uh, but with some key supplements, which we'll talk about, um, of those other methods. And I just show one of Harriet's maps there. And this map is entirely from land races. And each of those spots is one of those pots we've just seen. And uh, Harriet and, um, and Di do uh, look at the genetic similarities through a range of different, uh, <coughs> in this case, a series of microsatellites. The details don't, know, don't matter for those who aren't geneticists. And you can see how the analysis how from analysis like this, Harriet can show that all um, Brumpal millets in Asia actually started out in North China and spread from there. This was quite important because in the early days when archaeobotanists were finding um, crops a long way from home, if I can put it that way, the kind of default um, um, uh, hypothesis was, was to look at multiple domestications. So we've known about Brumpal millet, early Brumpal millet, in Europe for a long time, and because it was so early and there wasn't a narrative to go with it, the default uh, hypothesis is, well, that must be a multiple domestication. And so the genetics is quite important to, to show that's not the case. And somehow or another, we've got to explain that all of that when it comes from China. The second arm to the work <coughs> is, um, regular archaeobotany, and, and it's, it's very fortunate that a number of teams in the world with, were really going great guns with, with, um, with flotation in the parts of the world. So as we were doing the project, a, a, a great body of archaeobotanical materials come together. And I just picked out one colleague here, Zhao Jujun, Jimmy Zhao uh, from uh, Beijing, who, did, who, who created massive momentum of, of, archae, of flotation and archaeobotany in China over the last 10 or 15 years and really throw, created a vast amount of data we can use. And I also want to mention another development that uh, had been very important, and that was um, Dantos' work in Irving, California. And it's very techy work, very technical work, uh, reducing the amount of the sample size required to do a carbon date. And that was absolutely critical to our field because the work that uh, Santos was doing and was picked up by Richard Stark in Oxford, and we worked with Richard to start directly dating individual grains. And that has been a, a really important part of the development to be able to directly date individual grains. And so that's been a, a, a very important development there. And so those are two arms of the work to put that map together. And the third 
arm of the work is um, is stabilized tape analysis of skeletons. <coughs> and, and two two colleagues have done a lot of work on that uh, in our team were Emma Lightfoot and Jean Lee Lure. And the, the convenient thing about our globalization studies is if one looked at the crops that were moving uh, east and west, they so had a series of West Asian crops, wheat, barley, rye, and oats that were moving to the east, and uh, another series of eastern crops moving to uh, the west, common millet, foxtail millet, rice, and buckwheat. And just as a fortunate circumstance, two of those crops uh, were C4 plants, and so one could pick up what people were eating uh, from the stable uh, carbon isotope <coughs> from the bones. So that so as, as, so the genetics gave the, the overall map of what was happening. Uh, the archaeobotany pinned it down to to geography and particular dates, and then the isotope studies uh, connected that with what people were actually eating. So it's a very nice trio of of, um, of methods to put that map together. And in order to take you through the maps and various methods for. Um, Methods related to uh, you'll you'll notice in a number of the diagrams a red triangle, and that's just some of the map, some of the diagrams I'll show you are a bit complicated in terms of where the chronology is. The red triangle is just to help us all keep our eyes on a period between 1800 BC and 1500 BC, where a lot is going on in terms of food globalization, but there's also stuff going on um, from after. 2,500 BC, mm -hmm. earlier than that. So the, the only reason I do that is to introduce this uh, device that will help us through some of the later diagrams. And to remind us, as I say, it, it relates to, particularly the, the later period, relates to, to a time when different parts of, of Eurasia, there are these ranked patriarchal societies with mega sites. And so it's interesting to ask uh, how it relates to those um, things. Well, let's kick off with not the not the same map as I just showed you, but the equivalent map for two thousand five hundred BC rather than fifteen hundred BC. So, in the in the paper, we were able to do a series of timelines, and I kind of wish we'd done more actually, but at, at different timelines to look at how how crops have started moving around. And so, you can see this one a thousand years earlier than the uh, other map, in which there's. A fair bit of movement, but it hasn't actually interconnected across the map. And I've also down up, um, down the bottom put some uh, some recent publications on human DNA, and these are papers that combine contemporary DNA with with ancient DNA from skeletons, and they show a picture. Um, um, if, if we take the one the one uh, the the Rivola, um, et al shows a picture of how um, uh, Anatolian populations were spreading across uh, Europe uh, between sort of, well, throughout the Holocene. And the one on the right is where Yang et al. do a similar thing on just two timelines with early Neolithic and present day, showing the mixing of North and South populations there. The reason I'm showing these is to make the point that all of that movement of crops can be explained by the movement of people. It doesn't mean that it all was the movement of people, but it can be explained by the movement of, of people. There's sufficient movement of people to explain north and south in China and in both directions from the first question to account for those arrows in terms of mobile ecosystems of people moving with their, um, of their crops. And the reason I emphasize this is that, well, there's another thing I want to make about um, it. And that is, well, the reason I emphasize it is, is that if we go back to 1500 BC, you, you start, if you, the difference between those two maps is, as you can see, the red arrows from the, the two minutes in particular, with well, a number of arrows there and the, um, uh, the, the green arrows of, of rice and buckwheat moving uh, west. Uh, 
those arrows can't be explained by a similar human genetic pattern. So the difference between those two, between the, the 2,500 map and the 1,500 map uh, in, in the arrows relates to the movement of plants that can't be accounted for by human genetic patterns. And the reason I put another map there, uh, which links a series of material cultures attached to a cordyware and Yamnaya, is there's a lot of, of discussion amongst the human geneticists of a later period of movement of peoples or, or movement of, of, of human genetic material, I should say, relating to cultures north of the Black and Caspian Sea. And that doesn't, we could say, I think empirically, that doesn't connect with the initial stages of uh, crop globalization. And I, I think that is as a result of field work rather than just assumption. And for example, in our own team, we, when we were entertaining the possibility that this more northerly pathway could, could be involved uh, with, with crop movement, we did uh, some field work about there. And I can see some people in the room that were with us at that point. And we, we essentially, at, at sites in North Kazakhstan, assembled uh, negative evidence for the sort of absence of crop movement. And the issue, interesting thing was the same time we, we were doing that flotation in North Kazakhstan, in South Kazakhstan, along the Tian Shan Mountains, uh, Robert Spengler and Michael Pichetti were doing uh, flotation and they were finding where the crops were moving around. So um, it's, I think it's pretty clear that in the first instance, uh, the crop movements are hugging not going across the steppe, but hugging the mountain corridors. Uh, and it's only at a later stage, uh, probably, by, probably by about 1000 BC, well, um, in fact, Ender Lightfoot has, has shown that by 1000 BC or 900 BC, there are crops in the north of Kazakhstan. But this initial um, episode, they're hugging those um, mountain corridors. <clears throat> Well, in terms of looking at what's going on, uh, I want to home in on one of these areas where it's, uh, you can see there's a lot of arrows floating around. And fortunately, um, there's been a lot of good work done, um, not least by uh, uh, colleagues at um, Cameron Petrie and Jennifer Bates. And I just wanted to summarize, well, there's, uh, there's a quote there from Cameron uh, about a site of Masudpur uh, in North Italy, in which he says, the evidence from Masudpur 1 and 7, for the use of millet rice and chocolate pulses in the pre-urban and urban phases, suggests that local Indus populations were already adapted to living in a varied and variable environmental conditions before the development of urban centers. Now, what, he's, what Cameron is saying there is if you look at the first episodes of where you have that mixture of eastern and western crops in Masudpur. It's not related to the big urban sites. It actually precedes them. And that's a theme that, that I'm going to come back to again and again, that in different parts of Eurasia, if you can actually pin down which communities or which people were actually at the start of moving crops around, it's not at the big centres. It's on smaller sites. It's sometimes... Um, as we'll see with, with people who skeletally are not that uh, well off and so forth. And so <clears throat> I think that the, the observation that Cameron made here at one site is something that recurs um, again and again uh, throughout the landscape. And to illustrate that, I'll stick with Cameron's team and, his, and the work with, he did with Jen, Archibald and Jennifer Bates in Gujarat. And Jennifer um, pulled together a lot of botanical evidence in Gujarat, again, seeing crops moving from different places. And here is uh, Greg Purcell's picture of a series of sites. And among those sites are some of these massive sites, a couple of massive sites of Dolavira here and Lothal. And Jennifer's work showed that it's not at those massive sites that you see the first evidence of those crop interconnections. It's at sites like Roji there, which um, I don't know if you can see the size of it, but it's a much smaller site, about 200 meters 
across the whole thing. And in small sites in Gujarat, it's where you first see the mixing of Crockton East and West. <laughs> so that was quite interesting in terms of who's uh, doing it. If we move on now to what I want to focus on is um, another of the crops moving around and moving to Europe and follow that red arrow, arrow in terms of um, some of the uh, millet uh, grains. Now it was very much um, millet grains that, that got us into thinking about food globalization and what turned out to be some um, badly dated evidence. So here's here is a, a paper that we did very early on, uh, for 2008, and 2008, and this is a taking one crop, broom corn millet, and just summarising all of the um, uh, uh, published archaeobotanical records that pre predated uh, 5,000 Cal BC, and we didn't hadn't done the work by then to show that all of that millet actually came from China, that came a bit afterwards. But what we, were able, what we were able to do was to have a good look at these dates and with that new method of direct um, uh, carbon dating. And here you can see one of those red, just to anchor us in there, the 1800 to 1500 BC is that period. And this was the first time that we used the refined method of carbon dating to redate a number of those uh, millet grains. And what seems to be the case now, that if you look at, if you look at the millet grains, if you get a direct date of millet grains, there's a timeline after which in Europe that they're there. So you can, you can see millet in the, uh, starting in China and by, um, well, after 1500 BC, getting all over um, Europe. This has been in, built on by Filipevich et al. This is a paper just come out uh, three years ago, um, where again, directly millet grains from, from all over, um, uh, they've been able to uh, map this. There should be, I don't know why it doesn't show up, there should be maps of Europe uh, showing up in that slide. But essentially what those, those dots show in that time sequence is uh, from around 1550 calibration BC, an appearance of millet, of brimful millet all over Europe. So if you can imagine a map of Europe that somehow disappeared from each of these sites, that's what those, all of those um, blobs represent. <laughs> And again, if you look at uh, uh, Filipovich dates, there I put in the rectangle again to anchor us into where the dates are. And pretty much you can see the same thing as, as a, a, an episode in which the minute really gets going across Europe. And there's also an observation which I find quite interesting. And that is that it's not a, a uniform effect of everyone's um, uh, growing the millet. Within the landscape, there are also sites <laughs> without, without millet, and it's, it's a piecemeal thing. But on the one hand, as we've already seen, it's small sites begin up, and it's not every small site. We have a sort of peppered effect of, of uptake in the sites um, across the landscape. And another uh, interesting example is with Emma Lightfoot's work on stable isotopes and picking up who's actually eating um, the novel crops in these areas. So what you have here is, is, is uh, Emma taking a series of sites, in this case in, in, in Croatia, and from the, <clears throat> from the isotope, um, Enrichment of pick up who's who's uh, eating millet. So these 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 ones which are low down in the enrichment are eating less millet, whereas this one is clearly uh, eating an input of millet to get the isotopes elevated to that level. And 
what, what the three groups are, are different forms of graves. So you have architectural graves on the right, of the stone slabs and so in one form, and the millet eaters are in simple pits. So it's another, ex another example of who's at, at the front end picking up these new crops. It's people on, on smaller sites and in some cases with simple burials. And, and so it's another bit of uh, evidence that the, the, the agency behind this movement of crops could be with um, early low status um, communities. And just to com complete uh, <clears throat> that narrative, uh, this is a, 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 a site where fighter lists were used. This is a site in, in uh, Mesopotamia, there's kind of massy there. It's a, it's a site where fighter lists were used to pick up these crop horizons. And again, uh, the earliest evidence of millet within these sites, um, if you look at the dating, again, with the rectangle there, show we are, it's the same timeline. But here you've got a modest size, modest size site within Mesopotamia. It's also uh, part of the millet eating uh, community. And that's and that five head hectare site is the earliest evidence of living in the Babylonian sphere. So this is Laugier's map who did that work, which just came out last year. And um, he's he also published <coughs> a map of his take of, of if you like the western end of, of globalization. The thing that quite interests me about this map is there. You've, you've seen the sites with Rumpel Millet, with Panicum Milliaceum, and you can see that series of, of blue sites from the, um, uh, from the second millennium, which is consistent with all the millet going on. I was also quite interested in the yellow sites. There's a series of, of third millennium sites with millet, and I checked back to the um, source of these, and these haven't been directly uh, carbon dated, so I don't know um, whether when they're directly carbon dated, they'll move forward in time, like the ones that Harry looked at. But I'm still keeping an open mind. And the reason I'm still keeping an open mind on that is although, as we've seen, um, uh, the bulk of the evidence of globalization fits in what hovers around this 1800, 1500 window and after, there's still a fair number of bits of evidence that there was a sort of trickle thing going on much earlier than that. And uh, one example is in relation to the isotopes, which, as I mentioned, show when people are consuming a number of seafood crops. And this was a, um, the result of work done by, again, Emma Lightfoot and Jin Lee Liu, looking at uh, uh, crops. And all, all, of, all, of, all of these dots relate to uh, human bones that have been sampled for isotope analysis. And, uh, the black uh, dots are ones where there's no evidence for millet consumption. The white dots, which you can see over here in North China, are ones uh, where millet consumption by most of all the people, which fits in with what we want, we think. But the interesting thing is three, three gray dots there, and the gray dots is an intermediate level where, this, where from the C4 signal, there's some consumption millet. And as you can see, the dates are going to be very early. Kalamaki, um, beginning of the third millennium BC, and uh, at the Minnesota ba Basin, somewhere in the middle. Now, I don't know what that means or whether, whether one can think of another example, but I'm just explaining why um, I still think uh, there are bits and pieces of evidence to suggest that although a lot was happening, in, in the mid second then BC, there's a sort of trickle thing in the previous uh, millennia. There's still lots of bits of evidence to suggest that, even though the majority of the early dates are shown to be broad. If we just compare that map to, to what happens within the second millennium B BC, where we're very, there's clear evidence uh, of uh, movement of millet, um, of movement of the West. And, you can see a, not only you can see a, a number of grey dots, but you can also see white dots in the West during the second millennium. Not only is that minute coming into the West, 
but also it's being adopted to a level where for some communities it's the major uh, uh, cereal they're eating. So that's, that's uh, quite interesting. That's um, the minute going east. One can use the same method to, to look at wheat and barley uh, coming, sorry, that's the minute going west. You can use the same method to look at how the wheat and barley uh, moves east. And um, uh, this is one of Ginny's articles, which I'll, I'll um, explain to you by again putting a timeline in. And if you look at these carbon dates here, uh, and there's the rectangle again. There's uh, that timeline on the 1800 BC separates uh, two sites, uh, Wuba and Motueta, uh, by the triangle and the X. And if you look at the triangle and the X on this uh, uh, C13 diagram, uh, all the triangle and Xs are to the right of this line and so the suggestion is that before 1800, 1800 BC that they're, they're, they're eating millet. <clears throat> All the other sites including uh, Mohu which is the one that uh, I showed a picture of. All the other sites post-date 1800 BC and all of those sites everyone's eating a, a, a significant amount of um, uh, wheat and barley. So it's quite interesting that it's not symmetrical. There's, uh, there's so much evidence that the, the, the minute trickles uh, into um, uh, uh, the west of Eurasia in this piecemeal way. And at least if we look at, the, at, at this sort of data, we can see wheat and barley kind of, at the same time, kind of flooding eastward. And if I can express that in a different way, those sites, and those sites are all from a corridor called the Hershey Corridor, which links the central plains uh, to Asia. And there's the site of Mogu again, you've already seen that picture. And <clears throat> if you look at the Hershey Corridor um, before 1800 BC, and that's where the two sites are, that's where the communities around there were just eating millet. And then um, after 1800 BC, uh, there's a significant consumption of wheat and barley alongside millet on all sides. So it's interesting how one can pick up these, these patterns of difference. And one of the neat things about this coming from human bones is you can also look at the, um, the health status of the people eating it. And, and some of you will remember Jenna Dittmar, who did great work on this. And, and Jenna actually worked on the same uh, uh, cemetery at Mogu that we did the isotopic work on. And uh, she found, as, <coughs> as one does with Keith and Angela, a range, a range of different uh, pathologies, including pathologies related to diet. So this uh, picture from Jenna's work is a, um, is a, is a skull with, with extreme scurvy, so that extreme vitamin deficiency and we also know that they're in sort of uh, in the sort of pioneer end of importing wheat and barley so it's another connection between the movement of these crops and um, individuals that from a health point of view uh, again might be regarded as low status so um, that's a sort of a, another element that the agency of this involves uh, uh, have low status ordinary people. Mm. So that's something about the um, about the movement of these crops. I want to move on now to look at the reception of the crops moving into uh, two areas. So on the one hand, we've got this picture of crops moving around after, after 1800 BC eastward and 1500 BC uh, westward, and that must have and, and that must have been involved movement between uh, different communities. And then those crops came into regions which had culinary traditions, which as Dorian Filler and uh, Mike Rowlands in a quite important paper in Interweaving Worlds, showed are incredibly conservative. So one of the, the interesting features of uh, 
of uh, this movement and what's been described in other talks and series as localization is when these crops are, are received, although there must have been big changes in social organizing or big changes in exchange anyway for the crops to move around, once they were received, there's a lot of evidence that they were received into very conservative uh, culinary traditions. And I just want to pick up on uh, on the um, so that's essentially a, a large grain grinding dry cuisine, ha handheld cuisine in the west, and a moist, sticky cuisine in the uh, in the east. And so, in the east, you have a long history of moist, sticky food, which which some have argued is, is is why you need very early pottery to hold it together. And also steaming. There's a steaming pot here, and uh, a rather speculative thing that that is. Uh, what is claimed to be the earliest noodles in the world, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but probably actually more interesting and more clear cut is um, is technologies of not touching food. So we don't know about the chopsticks, but we assume they originated in the West, but the, the pork certainly, uh, 2000 BC, and um, you get in the East. And so obviously not touching food goes with more sticky food rather than mm -hmm. hand things. Um, but in terms of what we can do, looking at the crops and what's happened to them, the two things uh, that we've been able to pick up stuff from is, is looking at small whole grain and the stickiness. And, uh, and the next uh, image just will show a bit of that. Now, in terms of uh, the small whole grain, this is something from the archaeology. We can see this happens. This is a wheat grain in uh, the prehistoric West. And this is a typical wheat grain in the prehistoric East. So just looking at it, you can see that um, in receiving this exotic crop, it's small grains have been selected because this actually goes with whole grain um, cuisine. <clears throat> and this is, these are diagrams that uh, Ginny Liu put together of how those grain sizes pan out across uh, 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 Eurasia and so you can see central China here, the smallest grains of all, and the largest grains in West Asia, and uh, India is in the, and other places are in the middle. So on the one hand, you can see from very old-fashioned Arctic botany, that localization in terms of a selection for smaller grains in the East. With um, uh, Harriet's genetics, with Harriet Hunt's genetics, you can actually see that genetically, um, and uh, this is a slide I've already shown of the gene pools, but as well as using the genes to get a phylogeny, one can look at actual express genes. And uh, Harriet looked at the genes for stickiness. And, um, and this next slide is the three gene pools that have sticky gene in. And not surprisingly, all of those, two of those gene pools very much over the east but the one that's really interesting is uh the yellow gene ball because those have sticky genes in uh, and if you look at some of the uh mid accessions in the west and look at their dna makeup you can see that some of the western uh millets will uh, when they came were sticky and they've been and the sticky genes been bred out to make them unsticky so um you can see the receipt of sticky cereals um, and, and the stickiness, I should say, it's, a, um, it's about the, the protein balance. It's a balance between two proteins called the myelose and the myelopectin. So it's something that one can um, um, track. If you have no myelose, then it has all those sticky uh, properties. And that, was, that gene was bred out. And so it's another form of localization, pulling these, these new crops into this incredibly conservative cuisine um, in, the, uh, in the West. So just to summarize uh, so far, um, if, you, if, if you look at localization in terms of mobile crop and conservative cuisine, from West to East, uh, naked cereals are, are substantially preferred. I mean, that's another quite interesting thing in terms of whole grains. Uh, uh, at the time that bread wheat was moving, to China, it wasn't the major wheat uh, uh, in in the West. Um, other wheat, the Emma, uh, 
were much more important, but, but Emma is a close green grain. So naked cereals and naked barley are much preferred in the West. Grain size reduction of the wheat and several cereals lead to a sticky form. So it's only the, the brimical millet that Harriet's done that terrific work on. But you can see that in, in, in uh, Asia today, there's, there's sticky everything, there's sticky barley, there's sticky rye and everything. <laughs> and uh, if you move from east to west, uh, the, the sticky gene's silenced. And uh, something that isn't more uh, ethnographic now, <laughs> well, by the time you have the new records, millet and buckwheat, those, those uh, Easter crops, are being folded into a bread pancake cuisine, in other words, grinding and dry cuisine. So that's all been about um, moving, um, uh, moving uh, uh, east of west. But there's a third dimension, and the more and more uh, we looked at, the third dimension was quite a critical one. And the reason it was critical is a lot of that early movement was hugging the mountain, the mountain corridors and going quite high altitude. And so <clears throat> I haven't got those arrows over this rather wonderful map, but it's hugging. Those arrows are kind of snaking around uh, the, the um, mountain corridor. And as one does, I, I learned so much, or we learned so much from talking to uh, elderly farmers in various places we work. So here we are. Um, in uh, in uh, in uh, Xinjiang in Balikun, and uh, you can see various things there. You can see the mountains up in the distance. You can see what is now pastoral, but you can see a Bronze Age landscape in the field systems there. You can see the the, the Kazakh herders who are tented out there, and you can see in the front Mr. and Mrs. Ju, who um, although they look pretty young, they're I think they're about eighty, and they can remember several episodes of farming, and they explained how you farm these landscapes. And uh, I think all farmers understand you've got, you can't be that far away from water. If you're in the lowlands, you know where the water edge is, it's downhill. If you're in the center of Asia, um, away from, as far, as far away from the seas you can get, the reliable water is, is uphill. Sometimes uh, uh, downhill can be, very dry in an unpredictable way. But if you go far enough uphill, then uh, you'll find water. And they, exp they explained how, how you farm these areas um, in areas where the, where the rainfall is, uh, is sporadic and there can be long periods of drought and so forth. And you go up and up and up. And you, they, when, in their youth, they watched the clouds. And according to the clouds, they made sure all the, all the um, uh, drainage ditches were cut in the right way. And so when that rare rain uh, storm came down, they captured it all in their uh, crops. So they're basically cloud farmers. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, and, and there's a lot of knowledge there about how you actually farm if you're in areas that can be dry. And, and, and high, high altitude is, we've had the kind of technology to live at high altitudes some time, but we still don't have the technology to live without water. So talking to Mr. and Mrs. Chu, we really got a sense of why those pioneer communities hugged um, the mountains. And uh, in work we did with Fabu Chen, uh, <coughs> we, um, we, we managed to put this together in terms of the uh, archaeobotany in, the, in this 214 paper. And um, this is a rather complicated diagram. And again, one of the reasons it's complicated is time goes in that direction. Um, uh, but there you can see the, the key time periods uh, again. And if I take you through that, as we move up to, um, to uh, 1800, 1500 BC, what you've got there is, um, uh, red, well, up to about two and a half thousand meters altitude um, a, a series of, of, of farmers uh, uh, with, with mostly with root horn and pop down with it. You can see a bit uh, of, uh, of barley coming in there, the light blue is barley. And then after uh, 1500 BC, you get barley everywhere, and that allows uh, farmers to go 
higher up into the um, up into the hills. And so at the same time as you have movement laterally, you have that movement uh, vertically. And the reason that one of the reasons that vertical movement is interesting is because of um, work that 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 Dye did on 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 the plant's adaptation to different uh, systems. So crops where they start are fine tuned uh, to adapt to light, day length, heat, a whole bunch of things, and um, uh, fluctuating temperature and so forth. Uh, Dye's work particularly was in relation to the genes um, for day length. And if I can flick through uh, the key work she did, there she, she looked at um, another axis, and that was uh, uh, of, uh, of um, <clears throat> barley's uh, from various uh, la uh, latitudes going up into the Arctic Circle. And uh, th this is some of the historic uh, DNA that Dai used from, uh, from, from barley that was growing in the Arctic Circle. <clears throat> And you can see there that as you move uh, up latitude, the actual um, maturation to the flowering dates uh, for barley changes. And so the ancestral response um, uh, to see now it doesn't work anymore. And Dye's work was essentially looking at how those genes were switched off um, to, uh, to allow uh, part you grow there. So if we can imagine, uh, and, and this is a slide showing how the switched off genes, the blue ones, and this is her historic barley, and you can see after a certain latitude, the genes are switched off, which allows them to go north. Now, if, if um, we put that together um, with uh, that same gene, this is what we did with some Naya colleagues, uh, across Eurasia, uh, you see something quite interesting, and that is the body genes are switched off up here, and they're also switched off up there, but you can see from the square and the triangle, it's different switches switching it off. And uh, that, was, that was kind of very interesting. And uh, I think in a sense, the, the, the way to explain it is as, as you, in the um, mountain corridor, as you go up altitude in the mountain corridor, uh, the altitude is what's switching off those genes in different ways in different places. And once it's switched off, it enables a spread uh, that wasn't possible um, before that. So uh, whereas the preliminary localization was conscious, you have unconscious selection, which is also changing the game in terms of what you can do with these crops. So if we look at that, features of second millennium food globalization, crops moving in many directions, uh, rural agents of low economic status, which is something I've returned to uh, again and again, preliminary traditions resolutely persisting over these amazing periods of time, um, crops adapting to new culinary environments, so getting smaller or stickier or whatever they're doing, sticky, um, environmental um, uh, responses switched off and local and exotic crops brought together in many different uh, places. So I just want to look at some of the, in the final section, some of the consequences of that. And uh, this is kind of moving into uh, the Bronze Age and Iron Age, and this is Shenong, uh, the god of, uh, uh, of, of agriculture and the altar, and the altar of land and grain at Beijing, Sudetan. There's a, a very old five grain tradition, uh, Wugu tradition in China. And the, the different grains vary, but they're always some uh, local grains and some exotic grains. So at a certain point, uh, the five grain tradition got kind of embedded uh, in, in uh, the, the Chinese uh, cultural system. And uh, this is uh, looking at the uh, an interesting thing about the etymology. Now, this is about, this is an argument that I'm really not qualified to assess. And there are probably people in the room who are qualified to assess. Um, but this, uh, so I'm relating how the argument goes. Uh, this is uh, one of these uh, about 
1200 BC oracle bones. It's uh, the bones, skull bones or scapular bones that were used to divination in China. And uh, the, the symbols I've, I've uh, circled, the ones that are translated as, as wheat. And uh, there you have the symbol. And the general idea is it reflects an ear of wheat. But the argument that I don't really know, I don't feel confident to assess, is that uh, that uh, idea of wheat is uh, connected to the ideogram for lie, which is come to arrive. And that, uh, that ideogram is part of the, in the top half of, of my, which is the, 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 the contemporary Chinese for wheat. And so the argument is that the, the, the actual ideogram preserves the idea that it, it came from uh, elsewhere. And, and whether or not that's, uh, that sounds a lot, it is interesting that the, the three uh, cereals with them, uh, with, to which Mai is attached are wheat, barley, and oats, all of which came from the West. We know they came from the West to the East. And the, the, the cereals that went from the East to the West, millets and rice, all have the Mi stem rather than the Mai stem. So as I say, I'm not qualified to uh, take those apart, but I thought uh, I should share them with you uh, anyway. Um, it's kind of on safer ground if you go to uh, Mesopotamia, because I think what we can, we can actually say is that food globalization was actually, I, sh I should also say that the oracle bones are about 600 years later than the influx of those cereals. Whereas in Mesopotamia, it's more or less contemporary. So here you have a cuneiform tablet from Girsu, around about 2000 BC, which, so they tell me, mentions sesame. Now, sesame isn't one of the long distance travelers, but it's come from India. And uh, uh, this is the only one I could find an example that mentions what's translated as millet. And uh, I couldn't find one from Nippur, but, there are, but millet apparently is, is mentioned in in uh, cuneiform uh, from Nippur from about the middle of the second million BC. So it's a kind of um, it's an interesting thing that it connects with, with uh, that. And just um, because that's Abu Salabek, which was uh, him, uh, Nick Poskate's site, uh, he actually, he actually uh, found it, uh, Stephanie seen so that was kind of nice. And so just to, to sum up some of the points that I've made in this talk uh, uh, and suggesting a sequence. What I would say is, is that up to 2500 BC, we can see various expansions of cultural packages, uh, people, livestock and crops. In other words, what I've described as living ecosystems moving around the place. Um, and that, that's a globality, whether it's, it's globalization in the strict sense we've heard about in other lectures is this. Yes. But after 2500 BC, uh, and especially between 1800 BC and 1500 BC, you have a global movement of crops detached from their original context and through rural exchange between low status agents and some contrast patterns going between East and West. And you have both conscious and unconscious globalization. And uh, the unconscious globalization, i.e. the kind of disabling of all the ecological functions of the plant, is actually what went on to allow these crops to be um, used in multi-cropping systems, which was so important in the subsequent uh, later prehistoric period. And the whole point about having a, 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 a silenced an ecologically inert crop is you can grow it in the wrong season. So you can, you can line up crops um, in the optimal season when the local crops are grown and the disabled crops whenever you're prepared to provide food and, and water and so forth. And so assimilation, assimilation into emerging mercantile landscapes themselves supported by multi cropping. So there's, um, that's, uh, that draws on a fair bit of work, which is why there's a lot of people there. And I, I managed to fish out these three photos. I think, um, I think everybody in these photos made some 
um, significant contribution to some of the work we've been doing. And uh, thank you, Chris, for finding that one on the right. This is party. And also a whole bunch of other people besides. And I hope that's made some sort of sense. Thank you very much. Okay. So do you guys have any questions? Oh, we already have one. I've thought of one already, but then I'll get yeah, me ask the first question. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about do you have any possible like explanation for the positioning of like it being tied to low status individuals? Like is it a labor investment, like more less labor investment required or like environmental preferences or something like that or do you have any yeah. explanation i mean at the other end of that i think uh the optimal thing for the central powers is to wait for the low status people to do the work on the crops before so there is a point if, if you like if if part of so if if part of uh, uh the agenda is multi-cropping maximal use um that actually uh, comes after the kind of unconscious accent of work of of, of 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 selecting for a crop that you could you could insert into those systems so that's a suggestion that, that actually the, the time for the elements to be brought together into something that is is um is uh, uh going to work in one of those hierarchical systems is there is something that's, that's kind of I noticed in doing this uh, um, in terms of what other um, uh, scholars are looking at is to a great extent this work is is about showing how uh, showing the evidence for when the crops become detached from their context and uh, and uh, become commodities and it it did interest me that in the same time period there are other scholars talking about how human labour Simply gets detached from the, the human person, the human family, and becomes a commodity, uh, which is very important in our society. So, in answer to your question, I, I mean, I, I don't. Um, I think I've been interesting to explore yeah. how, how different elements of the whole system are becoming commoditized, such that you can join them up together. And the long region isn't like that. What what I, I what I what is a big puzzle is is if it is between those stages agents and you have ex exchange between strangers between those stages agents i mean there's the question of how that works and is it just through extended families or what i mean but that's a, that's a that's a that's a that's a question that poses itself thank you yeah, thank you. I was wondering about the um, bringing in the an aspect of gender roles within the different societies, and as an extension to this work. I mean, from you know, from what you've looked at in terms of skeletal remains, you know, um, who's doing? We know that the growing brain takes a huge amount of upper body yeah. strength, and Ali McIntosh did the work that showed, you know, that Cambridge rowers were actually weaker than Neolithic female yeah. farmers and things. So, <laughs> I wonder if you could speak a bit about the gendered aspects of the yeah society. no i think that's really interesting you know, I, I like the site where I, I i'd be really interested what um yeah i mean there's, there's various things there i mean as i as i as i said one of the things that um although there wasn't you know there are people in the room know far about more about those catholic and bronze age sites than i but obviously there's a narrative that talks about the, those sites being patriarchal societies and there's a narrative which you may or may not um, um, share about early sites of being matriarchal. So there's an interesting issue there about whether the um, how the matriarchy might relate to those things. In terms of actual examples, um, I didn't see the, the the site I really wonder about is this wonderful site Mogu, which is on the Hershey Corridor, where, as I say, Jenna Dittman has been looking at it, and I don't actually know whether she's doing what her results are in relation to. to gender and so forth but that would be an absolutely brilliant place to look at it because there you've got the data on what they're eating you know what their um status so it's i i mean i i, I think i but i can email and ask her because it's a really interesting question but 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 uh there's a whole series because there's a whole series of of skeletal of, of cemetery sites along that uh corridor i think there's a it's a wide open field to Taken that direction. It's a really important question. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> this sort of related to the questions which you've just answered, but I was just wondering about these low status agents and obviously ultimately you've got mobility going on there yeah. and whether it's the low status agents who are more mobile than um, whether it's the plants which are moving or whether it's the agents themselves moving, I guess it's kind of a possible question to answer. Well, no, it's an interesting question. I think it is answerable. So, so I mean, as, as I was saying, in terms of um, the, uh, the, 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 the continent scale map, we can say, no, it's not um, uh, human mobility that's taken long distance. That doesn't really, that's, that's only tangential to your point because what you're asking on is a more local scale. If you take one of those small sites, you know, what, what is their, their range and how do they relate to their neighbors uh, in that range? And um, uh, absolutely, I, I mean, it, it's that, as, 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 we, as we know, that the main drive, the, 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 there'll be two main drivers um, to move around a lot. One, one is to find whatever it is, grazing or whatever. But the other key thing, which may uh, be more of a driver, is finding marriage partners. And so they will be part of mobile networks that do interconnect. And, um, and uh, those are questions that to be asked. I mean, at, at the moment, I, I mean, I'd be interested in if, if of, of, of the, the regions where the right sort of archeologists are taking those um, sites apart in the right way, I would have a lot of optimism for Northwest India, do you know what I mean? That, that those sites where as you can see there's been a fair bit of work. I mean, um, there must be people in Cameron's gang that are, that are asking about those communities on those smaller sites and how they interconnect and move around because it's absolutely critical. But yeah, and th th there will be mobility that, it, that could. The sort of population. The, the, the movement across could be secondary to the migration. In the, on an intermediate scale between the local and the and the continental, but yeah, more more open to using exotic crops and moving around. I mean, those mm. two things came together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. I mean, there can be examples where, and, and in the larger sites, that you know, tradition and conservatism can 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 drive it in a different direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elizabeth. I was wondering whether um, about the difference between crops for human consumption versus animal fodder and whether you're seeing uh, some of these new crops being used for animal fodder or not used, you know, all exclusively for human consumption. No, I'm just thinking about the ice works because the ice tote works that I've mentioned are in um, are on human bones, <clears throat> which doesn't really answer your question because I'm trying, I'm racking my brains now to think about good. The way, the way to look at that, which is a very interesting question, if they actually do the ice tape work on the animal bones, and um, which would be a great thing to do. At, at the moment, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, we, did, we did a bit of manual work, but not enough to answer that question. So we were, we were focused on the humans here, the ones that I'm involved with. So, so to some extent, that, that hasn't been. It's a really interesting point, too, because um, <clears throat> in terms of the risk, if, Within those those uh, um, uh, incredibly traditional conservative cuisines, th there's going to be a lot of barriers to that. Whereas you give everything anything to pigs, I mean, so so it, it's a whether, whether or not after a while you start eating what your pigs eat, I don't know. But 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 to ask the questions you're asking, yeah, particularly in particular, pigs is quite interesting. Yeah, thank you. I was wondering if you could just say a tiny bit more about what you actually mean by a conservative cuisine and what <clears throat> other forms of evidence there are for that. Right. So um, the model behind uh, the conservative cuisine uh, that uh, John Pillar and Michael Rowlands put together, to a great extent, it was a lot of it was to do with material culture. So, um, uh, well, it, it's to do with material culture and contemporary cuisine. So. I think it was rooted in the uh, in in the in the uh, in the observation uh, that uh, grinding whole grain and dry cuisine went to the west, and that was 
linked with the antiquity, the greater antiquity of grinding tools than uh, than the containers, as we know, pottery is is is, is extremely late in the sequence in the in the West, where it's extremely early in the sequence, and um, uh, and then the, and then again, it's a, a material culture evidence to to go with the boiling and the steaming um, uh, in the uh, east. Is that right, Chris? That there are original the, things. So the key large... thing is the boiling and steaming vessels. Yeah. Stop as you go into Central Asia. So mm. that would suggest exchange of crops. It's like yeah, answering David's question. Yeah. So it's, it's, it, it was originally yeah, material culture driven, and, and so uh, our thing <laughs> bringing in the actual crops is secondary to the idea that it's, it's largely drawn from conventional archaeological evidence. Okay, one, one question, and then we'll go to the next. Okay, so, uh, yeah, a question uh, from Inanna, who is also one of our speakers, mm -hmm. uh, about the kind of mechanisms and agency of uh, diffusion. So uh, she writes as follows, wonderful lecture, Martin, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask how you would explain the scope of crop movement after 2500 BC, and what specific socioeconomic structures and processes mediated it. The movement seems to question the long-standing claim by world system theorists that before the Industrial Revolution, there were no bulk movements of commodities and that long-distance movement was restricted to luxury items. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you, Inanna, for encapsulating because I think she, um, she is right. I, I am challenging. <laughs> and um, I think, uh, so I hope I've assembled the primary, uh, primary evidence that successfully challenges because I think it's really um, built up and as, as you can see from you know quoting other scholars uh, you know I'm, I'm not alone in those kinds of observations in terms of what the socioeconomic structures are that I think that goes back to David's question really because at the same time as we've been focusing on you know urbanization and hierarchical leaks and so forth we we've had a, a, a simplistic model of the farmer and, and a simplistic model is what the farmers are farming and, and you know maybe they're kind of nuclear families or extended families where, where of course uh those low sacred sites have all the same challenges around uh social alliances and particularly marriage partners such that they need to be part of a larger network and uh in some of the uh in some of the if you have conventional narratives those networks are enabled from the center. And so I think what the evidence shows is, is we can't explain them that way. We can't explain the networks as enabled um, top down from, um, from, from those cities. So, so I think, although I don't have the answers of what social economic structures, I think, I think it, it's along the lines of, if, if we understood how those farmers and small governments were interconnecting as, and, and how it's independent from the hierarchies that later on exploited it all and turned it into an extractive system, um, then that would be uh, very interesting. At the moment, I think we can say, in terms of, of thinking realistically about how com communities work, uh, we, we could say they certainly existed. The evidence is not that they were uh, top down centrally enabled that they're independent from that and uh, uh but beyond that i can't really answer an honest question but that's the direction maybe one final question from matt and then well i mean yeah. unless you guys have all questions then well, I, we can answer them. I had yeah yeah we can also continue i had two cheeky questions the first one is that on that point so in the project with chioma one of the things we were exploring or chioma was exploring was the relationship between food production and other specialist producers like metal workers who may be engaged this in, in North Africa, for me. Sorry, yeah. West Africa, West, yeah, West Africa yeah. uh, may be engaged in trade of other kinds of goods and commodities. They may even be itinerant craftspeople themselves. I was just wondering if if you've explored that avenue as one in terms of thinking about mobility of the crops. Other producers are moving, other goods are moving, foods tend to move along those same pathways and networks with those people who might have those tastes but want to carry them with them. The, the other one was just about um, crop diversity. So this also seems like a nice narrative of 
on farm or within site diversity and increasing diversity. And I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, on the first one, I would, I would um, propose to you as the other way around. I think what the evidence is leading towards is that it's through the foods of life that those networks are being built. And once they're built, they enable those, those uh, other transactions. I mean, in a sense, as you say, the, the traveling class person or something I think has got to have a way of arriving with strangers. I mean, the interesting thing about the whole thing about this is, is how strangers engage and so forth. And um, I would say past many recent reading of the evidence is that the, is the food networks are creating the safe spaces whereby the stranger can move around. And, uh, and yeah, but it's a testable hypothesis, you know what I mean? It's about looking at the dates of it and, and looking at them. And, and that's the way around that, really. So just that the, the, the crops are moving before you're seeing the evidence for longer distance trade of other goods? Oh, certainly for the longer distance trade, but I think even on the, on the, at the local level, yeah, I would, I would, I would say so, yeah. Yeah. Cool question. Okay, we can continue this session in the reception. And I've been wanting to do this all day. May the force be with you. <laughs> <laughs>